Yeah, so welcome. I'm so glad to see so many of you in the room. And I see kind of a wide range and spectrum of ages. So I think we have a wide range of issues. As she mentioned, I have experienced career transition myself. I started my professional life at IBM having majored in mathematics at Wake Forest. It seems like a good thing to do because I could and I had the skills and then they recruited me and it all just seemed so logical. <laughs> and then I was a really unhappy puppy for quite some time. <laughs> <laughs> and so, yes, I earned a, a decent amount of money. Um, actually, there are eight of us recruited by IBM to Davisburg, Maryland from Wake Forest that year and year the highest undergraduate salary reported before that. So, you know, it's hard to turn that down. <laughs> But the years went on, and I wasn't happy, and fortunately I got to a position where I was able to decide what I wanted to do when I transitioned and got a master's degree in counseling while simultaneously having many babies and all that sort of thing. So um, it was a great thing for me, so I'm more than 20 years into this new career, and you could almost argue that my past nine years at AU in higher ed is yet another kind of iteration of a career change, where I moved from working with adults and transition from government and community agencies to working into a university setting where I think I've just really just found it. Um, I just, just love it. So I want to talk to you today about wherever you're at, some of the things you can think about and some tools to use as you consider or are going through your own career transition. So you're sitting here, how many of you are in the midst of change now? <laughs> <laughs> so well for me, so I'd start to go a little bit crazy in full-time mom. So I needed, to, I needed to personally connect out there, but that's a completely valid thing. So some folks are re-entering or bumping it up after stepping it back. How about, how many of you ready to reimagine life? Maybe you're at the end. Mm -hmm. Reimagine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> so we're going to talk a lot about reimagining um, and, and getting some ideas around that and how to execute that. Moving up, how many of you are in a position and you want to move up? I'm going to discuss some tools that will help you to make that argument within your organization or to other, other, <coughs> other potential organizations to help you with that transition, even from the same career field, really focus in on what is it that you're good at to help make that argument for moving up. And then anybody in that unplanned transition where it's been foisted upon you, either by an employer or a change in family circumstances, yeah, that happens too. And that can happen to any of us at any time. And when I worked at the Commission for Women, I worked with a lot of people who were going through that, that, that change that had to happen because somebody else made a decision for you. And that's probably the toughest change of all, but you do get through it. Just, we'll talk about that at the end of the presentation, how to get through it. And even when you're more voluntarily doing it for those first three reasons, it's a little bit tough. So here we are, we're at the beginning of this journey, looking ahead, trying to figure out how to navigate the waters of change. Bear with me, I decided to go with the flow on the water thing. <laughs> Before we go, I have a little commercial. See this handsome man? See him from engineer to teacher. And in the most recent article of AARP, so those of you who are over 50 and are going to get this with Bob Dylan, <laughs> AARP does have a whole thing going this year on reimagining. And it just so happens that that is my beloved husband. Aww. Aww. He's here as well. But they have some other cool stories about people who have reimagined their lives and started new careers. So I refer you to that. It's on the AARP website. 
but they have a whole thing on reimagining. So I told him I was going to do this. He's like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> and we forgot to tell people like family members that this was happening. And so my sister was like, driving home on the metro, reading her AARP. <laughs> I'm going to really miss that IBM income. Please stay and don't become a teacher. <laughs> so he is loving being a teacher. Mm -hmm. So as you begin that journey, though, these are some things I want you to think about. As we begin, you're going to hit some log jams. You're going to hit some barriers. You may be facing them right now. And as a counselor over the years, one of the things I have found is that it is very often our language and our view of these barriers and the language we use around them that keeps us on this side of the barrier, that keeps us from getting around that logic. So I want you to consider your language and the things that might even run through your head while I'm talking to you today. So barriers, what are they? This is the language. The first barrier is should. This is not a good word. How many of you heard the phrase, don't shit all over yourself? <laughs> <laughs> it's a great word. But should really hold you back. I should make a career change. I should go do that. I should. And then what happens when you're saying that you haven't done it? What do you, how do you feel about yourself? What should? Regret. Yeah, no, regret, uh, yeah, should. Demoralize. Should demoralize. It's a demoralizing <laughs> word. So here's a way to rephrase that and to use some new language. Rather than saying, I should go take that class in Excel or Java or whatever, say, I would like to. I would like to take that class. I would like to change my career. I would like to take my retirement. Now think about it. Think about something that's going on in your head right now. When you change it to, I would like to, is that true? Yes. Mm -hmm. If it's true, then take that energy and work with it. If the response, I'll give an example of using this with law students thinking about going to law school. Any lawyers in the room? Okay, great. We have students, law <laughs> students think that they want to go to law school, right? I should go to law school. Change that. I would like to go to law school. Some students are like, ooh. <laughs> no, they really don't want to go to law school, and that's why they're not taking the LSAT, that's why they're not writing their personal statement, that's why they're not moving forward. They don't want to. It's a should, not a want. So think about that in your own case. So that's the first word, should. Change the time would like to, do that kind of as a test for yourself. And if that is really true that you'd like to, use that energy to move forward. If it's not, reassess. Maybe you shouldn't. Maybe it's somebody else's should for you. Watch out for that too, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can't. I would take that course, but I can't because I've got to spend too many hours driving to take care of my mom. How does that resonate for anybody in the room? I'm not that age. Most of my friends are dealing with that issue. I can't because I need to be home after school for my kids. The rephrasing for this is a really simple one. I choose to, or I choose not to. And that's okay. And it gets it back to that idea of choice. Very rarely have I met somebody where the can't is, is a real true can't. Some sort of incredible disability that prevents them from doing it, or somebody holding a gun to your head. It's a choice, and own that choice. And if you choose not to, because of the life circumstances that we're in, that's okay. But watch that word as well. But, well this is a biggie. This is a biggie. Um, I, uh, as a career counselor, man, particularly when I work with adults in transition, I can't do that, but I would do that, but that, that's a really good idea, but, 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 the, you know, putting it all together, it really says, I would agree I'd love to be a writer, but, but I'll never make any money at it, but, 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 but. The word to switch that to is and. Mm -hmm. I would love to be a writer, and it's going to be really hard to make a living. Okay, so you can work around some of those, how, how do you approach that? Are there other ways? to make a living to supplement being a writer? Are there ways to be a writer and make a living? I was just talking with a young lady this morning who's a writer in a trade association, for example. It's harder to make her creative writing fitting in, but she gets paid full time and gets a good benefit for writing and editing during the day. My college roommate, um, 
One of the most brilliant people I've ever met, major of English at Wake Forest, summa cum laude. Uh, she writes, the, she actually has fun of writing the catalog for the Lake Haines Valley website. <laughs> <laughs> and she writes in her spare time very motivational letters that will get you to pull out your checkbook and write a check to the foundation or a nonprofit that solicited her and she wrote for. But she has ways of getting that writing out. So there's all these ways around the butts. The butts are kind of like, they get in the way. You know, I, I, I would go back to work full time but I've still got little kids. I would like to go back to work full time and I have little kids. Is there a way to work around it? And then we get back to that, the choice thing. This one has a choice in all of it. And my final word, and I want you to think about this while you're thinking about creating your new resumes or heading into an interview or talking to employers, just. I hate this word. <laughs> I hate this word because people say, I just stayed home and raised the kids for the past 10 years. I just did that. I'm just a program assistant. I, I just help manage my boss's calendar and take care of her correspondence. I just did this little thing. And rarely there's nothing just about it. I stayed home and raised my kids for the past five years. I learned great organizational skills and ability to have amazing amounts of patience. <laughs> but what, you, know, you learn things or whatever it is. When you're and if you say just in an interview, it's just going to, you know. Tell me about this item on your resume. Oh, I just did whatever. No, you did it. Just ban the word. Ban. Ban the word just. Don't let it hold it back. It minimizes everything you've accomplished. So as we go through and talk about career change, and you start thinking, oh, I can't do that because I shouldn't do that, or I should do that, change that language and just forget this word altogether. Particularly when you are in that position of talking to prospective employers, networking, et cetera. There's nothing just about whatever you've done wherever you are on the career ladder and wherever you are on the career spectrum. Okay. So, you're removing the barriers and you're picking up with your boat and you're going around, you're going around that log jam and now you're at the point where you can choose and you're at a fork in the water. You can go to the right, you can go to the left, you can stay put if you want to, but it's time to move on and imagine where you want to be next. Okay. This is some classic, this is how we career counselors think. <clears throat> when I'm working with somebody, we're trying to figure out what do we want to do, I think about these four circles. And I, our speaker this morning gave me a mar marvelous segue when she talked about the personality, when she was talking about meeting with that, um, the, this, the, the lawyer, powerful lawyer, and he didn't understand how she did well, but she, how she could stand what she did. And she said, I would like to be in his world. Where we want to be has a lot to do with what is our personality interest. So let's go back in my life, 30 plus years, I'm a programmer literally working at the bit level, literally translating hexagonal code to binary code, tracking it across computer address spaces. That part of my brain is like a liquid mush right now, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> but I could do it and I was not happy because it wasn't a good fit for my personality. My personality says, you want to work with people. You want to motivate people, you want to help people. Computers? I moved into marketing there and it got better because I got to talk to people about computers. <laughs> <laughs> At the end of the day, I'm like, oh. <laughs> So, didn't that match my personality? Interest. What do you like? What do you like to do? What jazzes you? What are you drawn to in your volunteer life? What were you drawn to when you were in school? What activities did you do in school? Here's an interesting clue for me. Back when I was in school, I was a resident advisor for two years. I had the most amazing experience last week. I went to an alumni event at Wake Forest, and a woman came up to me, it was a woman in the 70s and 80s. And a woman from the class of 1985 came up to me and she said, I'm so glad you're here. I wanted to tell you, I, had to, I was on your hall, I had the most fabulous year that year, and it was because of how I ran the hall. Mm -hmm. And that was a passion for me that year. And it's so much like that, even what I do today. So there was a big clue, and I remember feeling like I was letting that go when I went into working with computers. So I've been this mom to all these cute little freshmen, and I loved it. And that was my interest area, and isn't it great that I'm back getting to do it? Skills, what are you good at? What do you like to do? Are you skilled at pharmacy? Are you skilled at working with little kids? Are you skilled at writing? And values, what motivates you? What makes you tick? Making a difference in the world. Earning a good salary to support your family or to have a retirement that involves a lot of travel. 
all of these, for each of you in the room, you've got a different core set of values. And we as career counselors, we want you to look at this whole set of things and find something in the middle here. So for me, 30 years ago, I could translate hexagonal to binary. A great skill. I, it was out here on my interest zone, though. So not something I want to include in the mix. So I'm going to give you some tools to help you think about how you can think about all these things for yourself. In the current counseling world, we do have formal assessment. How many of you have taken the Myers-Briggs Type Indicator? Yeah. So you've taken it in like a, skill, uh, like a team building kind of communications context. It's great. It's also great to help you understand career. If you haven't had access to a formal assessment that a career counselor can give you, you have to be certified. There's some good tools out there. This is a nice classic book called Do What You Are by Paul Teeger and Barbara Baron Teeger. I believe they re-updated this in 2014. And it's got, it talks about Myers-Briggs types and personality. Do you like to work with people? Do you want to um, work with data? Or you know, are you more focused on detail? Or do you do like bigger picture thinking? It takes a look at it from a career perspective, and it has some case studies and profiles of people. There's what are 16, what are called types, if you're not in BTI familiar. Um, but this is a nice little tool that you can look at, you can pick up at Barnes & Noble or Amazon that can give you some good sites without having to go see a formal career counselor, unless you'd like to. We would always appreciate the business. Um, so that's, um, but that's the, that's a personality tool. There are interest inventories out there as well. These can be, they're really wonderful. We use the strong extensively. Anybody ever take the strong interest inventory? <coughs> One thing to make clear, when you take an interest inventory, it will never tell you what you should be. Okay. What the strong tells you is how you compare to other people in certain occupational occupational titles and your likes and dislikes. Are you similar to an accountant or just as similar to an accountant? And those accountants like their jobs that you're being compared to. So if you take one of these inventories anywhere and it says I should, it, you, you shouldn't be walking away saying it said I should be A. It would be I am similar to people in these fields. I might want to go explore <coughs> some of those fields. So the strong gives you some broader information than just occupational titles. Self-directed search is something you can take online, and it looks at things like, are you interested in artistic subjects? Are you interested in, it helps you to sort of sort your interest in a way you may not have done before, and to help you get things swirling outside of your head and into a piece of paper. And this sort of helps you to organize your thoughts, is what I usually find. I find these tend to validate the idea that's already in your head more than it helps, that more than giving you a whole brand new idea. But sometimes it does give a brand new idea. So that's OK, too. There's a new book out there. I didn't even manage to grab it from my office yesterday. But it's not new. Um, Strength Finder. Anybody Strength Quest? Strength Finder? It's, you can get it again in a book. It's got the book. Assessment is in the book. And it, the idea is to play on your strengths, your natural strengths, and you look to career. So that's a nice one as well. So those are ways to do formal assessment. Um, I would tend to, when do I use these? I will use them with somebody who's really particularly having a hard time or really wants that validation, um, particularly if they don't have any ideas popping off the top of their head anyway. Sometimes we don't need to do formal assessment. And they're just talking to you all. Figuring out, what is it? What do you like to do? So this is a woman on a mountaintop. <coughs> she, she left the river and climbed on <laughs> But she's having a peak experience. And one of the things you want to think about, whether it's thinking about what your values are, your interests or your skills, are what are those just pivotal moments in your life where you're like, aha, this is great. This is fantastic. And to think about that. And so I have an exercise that I think is really useful. I'm going to give you a sheet of paper later that you can take with you. So what's a peak experience exercise? It's thinking about a time where you were fully engaged in a project or an activity, you really feel that you enjoyed it, most of the process. Maybe there was something you had to do in there that wasn't great, but you were in the zone, as they say, in the flow. You like to talk about the experience. It was fantastic. It could be professional. It could be from work. It could be personal. It could be uh, from a volunteer activity. Maybe you're a board member. Maybe you raised Girl Scout money. Um, it can be, it doesn't matter. There's no judgment on what the source is. And it can even go back into your school years. It doesn't have to be in the past five or ten years. You want to get at your true, what makes me tick? So, and the key things are you enjoyed it and you felt proud of the accomplishment. 
And then what you would do is write about it. Just sit down, write about it. And you'd want to do this for three, five, six, seven, maybe ten times for different accomplishments. Um, I would say a minimum of three. You want to write about it. What was it? And just write. I did this, we did that, I loved it because. Then when you're done, you sit back and you look at what you wrote. Grab a highlighter, grab a colored pencil, grab something. Highlight those skills. Think about what skills you had. It's amazing. But to take this another step further, share it with somebody else. Find your best friend, your spouse, your career counselor, and talk about it. Because what do you think they can do with that? You just tell them, tell them this story. What are they going to, how, how can they help you? Different perspectives. Sometimes we are so connected to our own good skills that we have. Those skills that for us are just second nature. We don't even know we've got them. I have talked to people who thought that everybody knows how to write. Writing's easy. There are so many things that if you're saying, <laughs> put that word just in it, I just did whatever. You know, I just I just helped the Girl Scouts raise, you know, two thousand dollars. No big deal. Because you're so good at fundraising, not everybody's good at that. So your you might minimize you might not even recognize it when you're thinking about that accomplishment. When you share it with your friend, your advisor, your mom, they're gonna be like, Oh yeah, you are so good at that, and that is a skill, and you really gotta hawk it. I've even talked at the college level to kids who are really good at technology who think that they that people are just born <laughs> knowing how to do this stuff. Uh, and and they're not. So this exercise is, I think, just a really wonderful tool to really get you thinking. And again, it's most important when you do it with more than one exercise. And again, that could be three exercises. For some of you, it could be seven or ten. Um, probably the older you are, hopefully the more you've got. But um, an example for me would be, um, my most recent one is actually a work-related one. Um, I came to American University nine years ago. And when I was at, at Wake Forest, we had a, a class in career exploration and development that I took as a senior to try to figure out my life. And I got to the AU and I said, do we have a class on career development for our students? Oh no, we don't do that here. So the years go by, oh no, we don't do that here. In 2009 or 2010, I was getting some feedback. We had a school of communications use our office as a case study of what students wanted. And a couple of the groups came back with, we'd really like to have a one credit course on career development, on career issues, because sometimes where it's junior or senior, you've got that one credit to fill out your schedule, and this would be much better than taking something like tennis just to fill out our, <laughs> our schedule. Go back to my boss, I'm like, you know, Catherine, I really want to do this. I got my boss's buy-in to create a proposal. I figured out how to network on campus and figure out, I didn't, I don't know, the, I did not at that time really know how the academic structure worked. I figured it out by finding some key people on campus to help me. I got people to buy in. I think it helped that the economy was kind of at a low point because that was also the point where people were bashing the liberal arts. And I took it from a perspective of we need to help students understand how to communicate the skills they get from their liberal arts degrees, which is most of what we have at American University. And I was able to sell it. And now I'm teaching the class for the fourth time. And I was just told we've got a um, budget for two classes next fall. I can find another instructor. But, um, <laughs> but I'm really proud of that. So what was good about it, um, I really honed in my networking skills and learned, learned, I learned a new thing with the academics. I used my persuasion skills. I learned, used my skills in, in career development and making a good syllabus that they bought into and like. So it was just a really good experience for me. But that's an example of a peak experience that I would write about and then pull out all those skills. And then maybe some of my colleagues would tell me other skills they saw me using that process. So for each of you, there's another one. I used to tell one about a birthday party I planned for my daughter, but we'll move on. But, um, <laughs> that was 21 years ago, and I still remember it. Another fun tool for those of you who are more visually oriented or creative, you don't have to be this creative, it's something called the Wandering Map. And I credit Catherine Brooks for this. Catherine has a book out called You Majored in What? So if any of you have kids who are looking at liberal arts, this is a fantastic degree for those who are in or just out of school. But Catherine is currently, she is the director at Wake Forest, but she came up with this when she was at um, a University of Texas at Austin. So this is a very, what this is, anybody here do mind mapping? Mm -hmm. This is not just a mess on paper, which it kind of looks like here. In the middle we have, it says me, 
And this is a fairly artistic person, which is one of the things that you can see. This word here says art. We have creating, designing character stories. Um, architect as a child. So what this is, is you start with a piece of paper. And I'll give them to you at the end so you can play at home. But just you put you in the middle. That's you. And then you think, what are those fun things, what are those things that I've really enjoyed in life? They could be skills, they could be events, they could be experiences. I don't even care what, you know, what grammatical term you want to put. But what pops for you? And you can put those. Now some students just put little nice square boxes and they, they do that. Or if you're more artistically inclined like this individual, you can so I get really creative. Great news is there's no rules. The idea is to channel what makes you tick, what fits your values, what do you like to do? So when I look at this, we see um, the student has, she's got travel, that says Asia, Japan, art, cartoons, college, there's a frown I think on college, so that's kind of disturbing. California, an airplane. So this person is really motivated by art and by travel. And maybe Japan, so maybe anime is a potential career for her. <laughs> but one of the things you also do is you can sort of see there are some lines. Once you've sort of thrown your boxes, is you can draw interconnecting lines and label them as the theme. So this looks to me like it's a travel theme, and then there's some art themes, and you can make those connections. Some folks who are more linear have nice linear lines and spokes and things coming out. But this is just a fun thing if you're so inclined to go this way and then to look at those trends and think about it and see what pops for me. Um, so I just think it's a really great tool. I recommend colored pencils if you got them and you wanted to be creative. That would be fun. So these are just some ways to help without going into a formal, you know, taking a strong interest inventory or to accompany it. We can do both. There's no one right way to do this. Let's take a minute and talk about skills. There are, when I think about skills, these are some hard skills that I would call content skills. Unless you're a native speaker of Spanish, in which case that is, that is not a, a content skill. A content skill is something you learn. And from an employer's perspective, you have to either learn it on the job or go to school for it. It's actually, if you think about skills as a pyramid, at the top of the pyramid are content skills in terms of what employers are looking for. They want you to be proficient at Microsoft Excel and know how to do you know, formulas and pivot tables and whatnot. You have to learn how to do that. They want you to be highly proficient and fluent in Spanish. They want you to know how to program Java C++. They want you to have that uh, CFA that she mentioned earlier, or a CPA. Those are schools you explicitly go, you go to school, you learn them on the job. A lot of those skills employers know that they can teach you on the job, by the way. So maybe your Excel isn't quite what they want, but they really like you otherwise because of things in the middle of the skills pyramid. And those are transferable skills. So transferable skills are sometimes called functional skills. And these are things that you can take from your current life that you use and use them in another context. So if I think about my husband, the school teacher, he was an IT sales guy slash engineer before becoming a math teacher. He did a lot of presentations. So he was very comfortable walking in and standing in front of students and presenting to students in that transition to teaching. That didn't scare him in the least. I think other things scared him. But not, not that being in front and teaching, because he's been teaching in different ways, but teaching adults and teaching technology to people. So that's what we call a functional skill, or a transferable skill. Here I have, so for example, if we look at this nice happy lady, these are from Flickr Common Commons, I do not know these people, um, Creative Commons. Um, we have somebody who clearly is spending a Saturday or Sunday afternoon selling Girl Scout cookies, and let's imagine that she has not just done that, but that, that little brownie troop has excelled and exceeded the expectations for, what do you call it in Girl Scouts, the National council, office or something whatever, like yeah. So she might have transferable skills that might be sales, Maybe she's a fantastic salesperson. Maybe her transferable skills is working with children. Maybe she just loves that, and that's why she said, I will do this because I want to help the kids do this. But she's got one set of skills. And maybe she's working right now, maybe she's not. But maybe if this is where she found her passion, that she can transfer those skills. This other one is an example of the silent auction. And I thought of that because I've known so many women who just really excel at raising funds in a non-paid context or coordinating events in a non-paid context. Even if you're doing another full-time job, and you do it really well. I clearly remember a client from the Commission for Women 
planned every year is some fantastic spring event for her elementary school. And she loved it and she owned it. And when she needed to go back to work, she took those skills and she became a DC event planner because she loved it. Unpaid, probably the people who organized that did it in an unpaid capacity from the looks of it. But, um, but we all do that, that, that paid jobs. In a university, those jobs, the development, boy, that's the top of the pay scale. I had a client go tell me after I started at AU what she was getting paid by University of Maryland to, to do development, and I nearly fell off my chair. Maybe I should change careers again. But this isn't my strong set, asking people for money. It's not my strong set. I don't enjoy doing that. So it's not a transferable skill. But think about what they are for you. It could be sales. It could be presenting. It could be teaching. It could be a great facility with numbers. It could be, if it's a programming language, that's a content skill. And if it's that ability to learn computer and new technology quickly, that's more of a transferable skill. And consider this, at the bottom of the skills pyramid, so the picture of this pyramid, you have content, transferable, are what we call self-management skills. What do you think the number one reason people get fired is? Some of you have probably done some firing. <laughs> I hate to say it, but it's probably true. I'm looking at the screen. Um, why, why do we have to get rid of people sometimes? El eliminating the whole financial downturn layoff thing. Can they prioritize? Do you have to walk them through everything? You want yeah. them to have some initiative on their own. Right, so somebody who's unable to, to plan their work. Yeah. They don't get along with anyone else. Don't get along and play along with others. Did I see a hand over here? Um, they just lack the motivation or passion or yeah. whatever. Yeah, they're just not on. doing the job. It's probably not that they don't know that, that technical skill that they were hired to learn, but there's something in that self-management, motivation, getting along well, playing with others, getting to work on time. Yes? Um, I have a question about these two pictures. like. Be identify me like in a nutshell, uh -huh. and so I, I laughed because I said, you know, I I will do this in a hot second. I will take over a Girl Scout school and I have take over a whole cookie collection, and make sure she got the highest award. You know, and it just started with just buying one box of cookies. But um, my question to you is that how do you um, like you know you don't want to be um, observed as someone who whose passion is not there. But when you have a skill like this, how do you transition it into like right. not just playing around and having a hobby? but really making sure that you can, I can, I can be really good at training and development, but how do you take these skills, you know, just as the okay. one here, and really, great question. you know, make it into a business. Great question. So you identify your skills. So say your skills are training, development, obviously some event planning. Event and planning. Yeah. Right, so you would actually take these skills. Make sure that's on your resume. It doesn't have to be paid to be on your resume, okay? You can have it under community service. You can even have it under experience. You might put, unpaid or volunteer in that job description. Um, but you can talk about it, it doesn't have to be paid. And then you prepare to talk about it in the, in the interview. But before that, you do your research as to what are the organizations and things that you might do this for. What are some job titles? Event planner, fundraiser, development officer. And you, you, do your, you get in and you do your research. Uh, this is just an example of somebody who's really good at transferable organization skills. It's a frightening calendar from 2000. <laughs> <laughs> But I, I, I had a woman who had five children, and every Sunday, she was single, going through divorce. Part of her drill every Sunday was to sit down with the kids, pull out great big poster boards, create a schedule of where everybody needed to be, and who was, some of them were driving, who was getting them where. And she was looking at jobs being like an executive assistant to help somebody manage their calendar. And I'm telling you, she would walk in there and probably run the place in, in two days. She was that good. And that's a trend, that ability to organize and plan and schedule I thought was just amazing. So we're back to pulling it all together. Um, you've done that assessment. And then you need to do some research. So if you really don't know about what career specific title or you've got some ideas like event planner, you can start with a resource like the Occupational Outlook Handbook. This is a fantastic tool put together by the Bureau of Labor Statistics. It includes broad career titles like um, uh, probably fundraising, like um, counseling, like psychology. And it talks, it's got several pages, it has information on what is the education that you need for that field? What's the job outlook? Is it gonna grow? Is it gonna decline? So you know, do you wanna go through a bunch of retooling of education if your career's on the down track? Um, 
what the average salary is, and there's some click tables you can click to find out in the state you live in what's the salary, because certainly a salary in D.C. would have to be a little higher than a salary in Oklahoma. Um, so we aren't just interested in national names. And most importantly, at the end of that, it links you into professional associations. So if you are thinking about becoming an event planner, there is going to be a national association of event planners, and it might be called just that. Does anybody know in the room what their group is called? Anyway, every career field represented in this room today, what you're doing right now, what you're thinking about doing a year from now, has some sort of advocacy group. I'm a member of the uh, National Association of Counseling and of Career Development, sorry. Um, there is the American Counseling Association, American, Psycholo American Medical Association, American, I'm sure there's a Pharmacist Association. So there's American Marketing Association. They have information on careers. They could be a resource for you to talk to somebody. So you can start by reading. Not sure, Google whatever it is you're thinking of. I know that seems obvious, but it's true. It can be really useful. And LinkedIn, how many of you are on LinkedIn? Of course you're all here at Business Networking event. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, you can find people on LinkedIn in these fields to talk to. Because after you do all that reading and maybe you're looking at some books, I really want you to go out and talk to people in those fields. And when your career transitioning, Having a cup of coffee with somebody or a lunch and talking about what you've done, those transferable skills. You know, I'm doing this now, but I just took this Girl Scout troop and I filled my dining room with 2,000 boxes of Girl Scout cookies and they broke all records in their council. And I want to do that in an organization. I want to take those skills. You talk to people about that. Let them know what you can do. Sell those transferable skills. They're going to like you. And maybe you're just having that information interview, awkward term, but you're having a cup of coffee with them. You're building your network in the new field, and if they like you, they might even see if they can find a way to hire you. If they, if they can't, they're going to refer you to other people who might be able to help you. It moves from the thinking about all this right back into the networking like you're doing at an event today. Um, and I really, I think LinkedIn is invaluable to help find that kind of information. Yes? So my question about LinkedIn goes to the part where you were saying, you know, we're good at maybe helping someone else, but when it comes to ourselves and talking about our own skills, it's kind of hard to do that. Mm -hmm. I would pay somebody to do my LinkedIn profile. <laughs> 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 I mean, one year, so if, if I do this for other people all day long, uh -huh. but when it comes to myself, I'm like, okay, what do I do again? So my, pay, my profile is blank, oh, but yeah. other people have been clicking in all of the things that I... On the, on the, on the yeah, skills, but they've yeah. been endorsing, endorsing the academy. Academy. I just wish they would write the profile. <laughs> <laughs> well, there, I think there are now. I'm sure there's business people out there who write your profile. Uh, I'll tell you, um, I would rather you consult with somebody who can consult you on writing it yourself, because for both LinkedIn profiles and resumes, I strongly believe you should do it yourself. I have had red alumni come in and put a terrible resume in front of me that they then tell me they paid $350 for, mm -hmm. and I rip it to shreds because it isn't selling them appropriately. Mm -hmm. And so, I, and you also can take more ownership of your resume when you write it yourself and when you need to update it, and the same is true of a LinkedIn profile. Okay. So there are, if there, um, LinkedIn has got good tools on it itself. Even if you just go to the student page, we've got a cute video of key elements of a profile. Look at other people's profiles, see what you like, see what works for you when you can get others, and go in there and create it. The picture should always be warm and friendly. I do recommend pictures because here we all are meeting, and you're going to meet some people over lunch, maybe you met some people over breakfast, and you want to go back and connect on LinkedIn. If they have a picture, it's going to be able for you to realize that that's there are about 3,000 million Sue Gordons in the world, mm -hmm. so you'll know it's me, Sue Gordon, and not Sue Gordon, who works for Montgomery County Public Schools and recruiting. She almost came to one of our events for God's sake. So, um, yeah. I, I would suggest if you have any colleagues to pull up their LinkedIn and print it and then just see what words they use in their that's profile right. that's, and you say, well, yeah, that's similar. You don't have to pick yeah. the same format, mm -hmm. but at least you get a, a yeah. beginning of what do they see themselves doing. Yeah. Okay. And that's and there definitely are consultants out there that are starting to sell that service, but it's going to be, if you pay somebody to do it now, LinkedIn is a very fluid thing, you need yeah. to go and change it periodically. Mm -hmm. I want you to be able to do it yourself. But I do recommend having your profile up to date and up to speed. And for when you're transitioning, you can do that headline on LinkedIn. Right now it might just default to your job title. You know, you can put, you know, 
such and such ad event planner or something like that to kind of make that again change on, on LinkedIn. You gotta be careful with that if you don't want your boss to know that you want to drive to climate change right there. That's the only and I don't have a magic answer to that. Some people create, I think, a separate LinkedIn profile with that because that's probably about the only way is to have another one for the other field. Yes. So I'm just curious, when talking about transferring into another sector or another area, so one of my biggest things is navigating the fear of going from a senior level position to like I don't want to be an entry level person mm -hmm. in another area. Right. Starting completely over. Right. Even though I may have some transferable right. skills from a volunteer organization, I'm, employers are not necessarily going to say, you know, oh, that's great, you've volunteered in development, but I've got this whole other pool of people who've been in development for right. 20 years. I think that's where it gets into, I mean, you have a little bit of luck, a lot of learning to talk about it, talking to people. If you've got some management level skills, from management is talk about a transferable skill. So if you can manage in one sector and you supervise people, that you can do that in another is going to be amazing. So being able to get to talk about it, getting in front of people and talking to them really helps you get off that two-dimensional sheet of paper mm -hmm. as well. Sometimes you do have to start all the way back to the beginning. It depends on the field. Development, I'm not so sure. If you, what they care about in development is demonstrated success. And if you can demonstrate success, whether you're paid or unpaid, that's what they're going to care about. Okay, um, Sales and everything like that is what have you done. So you can make the case. Maybe you aren't going to come in at that same level. You might advance very quickly. Um, but so, so that would be my take. But again, getting out there, getting to know people, talking to people in the field. And I'd add for those of you who are thinking about that moving up, think back to the skills conversation we had, those peak experiences. When you want to make that case within your organization to your boss as to why you want to move up or that next boss, think about those. That's all accomplishment based. If you feel like you need to really move up, you don't go in and say you deserve a promotion because you've been there three years in the same role and you've done a great job. You give specific examples, those peak experiences can help of what you've done for them lately to motivate them to want to help you. Sometimes your boss is so tied up in their world, they don't, or particularly your boss's boss, and if your boss isn't a good advocate to your boss's boss, you literally can get kind of stuck. People not quite forget about you, but nobody's advocating for you. So you've got to be your own advocate in that situation, and using that peak experience exercise, looking back, obviously that's for that organization, can help you to modify your resume, your LinkedIn profile. Yes. I think Liz Bailey talked about the importance of mentors and advisors, and yes. in my transition, it's very been important to ask for help, uh, ask for advice, and because that's the out of sight, out of mind situation. But I'm in a situation that I'm developing a new field. And so the people, uh, as a medical musician, I'm a medical musician. Oh, how done it with Hawkins, prescribed music for now. So music therapists, I am an outlier. I mean, they are, I'm, I do not do what they do. And so it's a whole new field. So I'm having, I don't know, I'm in a, between a rock and a hard place, I would say. Yeah, you don't have a lot of people to talk to. Talk. Talk. I, I I but, but it's a tremendous opportunity because yeah. you're, you're starting that, you know, you're basically starting the field yeah. yourself. So you're like the... First person. Correct. Yeah. So we're real fine here on the cutting edge. And then, and yeah, and technology has enabled that and the globalization and you know, writing profiles for LinkedIn, right? It would pop up $20 and that might tweak. Anybody will charge you who does it will charge you more than $20. Oh, right. <laughs> 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 Mentioned that 350 resume thing you yeah, say. Yeah, yeah. yeah. These are the same people. So. So, but there are new fields out there, right. and the, and the uh, right. cell to society, bench to bedside, uh, yeah. uh, tr uh, tech transfer is a big, big, uh, big field. But and so the the field is not established. Right. So some of them. I can help you retranslate yourself. Okay. See, this is what's great about mm -hmm. this. There you go. Mm -hmm. This is creative. Mm -hmm. I feel creative. Good. Sorry. Yeah. So it, it's. You're going to be the person people want to talk to as they move into the field themselves. I am the target field. Yeah, so yeah. what do I do there? That, that, that's mm -hmm. just something that mm -hmm. I'm thinking about. But asking for help is the way to get to yeah. find open doors that right. I would so never be able to find if I were out there pounding the pavement. Yeah. You, you've got to go out and find the people out there in the target organization that you want to do this work in. Mm -hmm. uh, just networking. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's tried in old news from the career counseling world that networking is it. Yeah. You have a question about. Um, Taking a leadership role, mm -hmm. um, I've had a uh, long background in HR and other supportive roles, and so I guess the transition issue is for me is that when you when you want to, I went from HR to, which is hard to get out of when you're transitioning to somewhere else. Mm -hmm. I went to contracting. Um, I 
guess I'm trying to see how to um, help employers see that I'm more than just the support. Even though I love the support because I like it, it helps me to work better with people and um, make that communication. I find that it might not take you seriously if you have some such a good career in support because you want to transition to leadership in your life. You, you're staying in a cast. It's, it's remember going back, talking to people about what you have done, how, how that translates into other things, thinking about those key accomplishments, why you want to make that transition, what you have to offer to that transition, but you've got to talk to people. Maybe there's, um, maybe you can have, you know, it depends in some organizations, you can have open conversations with your supervisor about your career goals. Others you can't. Um, so that might mean you go information interview with other organizations about what the next steps might be and how you want to make a move. But if you want to make a move, do your research, update your materials, make sure that resume isn't bought completely biographical, make sure it's directed towards where you want to go. And looking at those peak experiences, getting those down to resume-sized bullets, you can have you know, professional experience, community service experience. You can put community service first if you want them to see that amazing thing you did first on your resume. You know, I could do a whole another hour on resume writing, but how you present yourself on that material and on LinkedIn can make a difference. LinkedIn kind of, I think they're doing something where you can shift sections around more than you used to be able to. So you might see if you can move, if there's a little drag when you edit yourself, you can get drag on community service. So if you want that to be above the current job or, or whatever. But you can enter a, under experience on LinkedIn. It doesn't have to be a paid job. You can put anything you want there. So think about how you're presenting yourself, marketing yourself. And again, I hate to say it again and again and again, but find people to talk to um, that can help you. And uh, you know, there's, there are stories after stories of people turning into uh, information interviews, into opportunities. I, got, I was in, offered a job on the spot in an info, info interview 20 years ago. Um, I've had students, I send them out not to do information interviews as part of my course, it's required. Some of them have pulled internships out of those experiences. So. It's, they're really valuable, and just gets that network going in that new field where you've got to start making those connections. And they'll, help, they'll give you advice on what you need to put on your resume, too, to help with the marketing piece. So, final note. As you're going through it, remember to breathe. Yeah. Hopefully you're doing something to take care of yourself. Um, I like to jog. Uh, lots of folks like yoga. Going for walks, if I'm not going to jog, I can't do that every day. My knees don't like that. Yeah. My, my puppy loves a nice long walk. He's really cute and he makes me happy. Mm -hmm. So my dog makes me happy. Um, take care of your body, take care of your mind. Life is going to be a roller coaster, particularly for those of you who are having this thrust upon you and you're not doing it by choice. It's going to be even more of a roller coaster because you've probably got some other stuff going on there. But eventually, you're going to, that roller coaster smooths out and it ends and you go on and enjoy your next step. So just live through this when you're down here. Remember it's going to get better and there might be another dive off before it gets bad. But just remember that. Take, do find those self-care things that work for you. It's different, again, different for everybody. And once you've gone around those barriers, those shoulds, those butts, those pants, you've chosen where you want to go and made those choices, you will arrive and I hope that each and every one of you is just as happy as this lady when we're back <laughs> leaping for joy over the water. <laughs> I've got a couple of, in addition to Do What You Are, there's a couple books. Um, Pathfinder by Nicholas Moore is about career transition. And uh, the all-time classic, I'm sure many of you have seen this, but Coding with Parachute, they still keep producing it. They've got similar things to the peak experience. Here's just a handout. One side is the peak experience exercise that you can work on later. Another is just a starting point to the wandering map. I just, I just thought I have a, like a sort of different perspective on that peak experience because I think it's great that you can do something that is um, um, uplifting, you know, you know, kind of pull that out. But I also know that there have been points in my life where Something happened that really knocked me for a loop. Took me into a spin. And you know, my initial perspective was to be kind of hard on myself and why couldn't I handle it? And and then you get hopefully to a point where the perspective is, look what that was for That's me. True. What it did for me, how I was able to handle it and get it to a better place. Or they might also flip it and say, What are those low points that may allow that challenged me, stretched me, and got me to do something in a way, so it's not just the high end, it's also what did the low end do that 
charged you yeah. and maybe you, you learned that. his skill while you did that. Right. Mm -hmm. right. So the, the question is, how do you break the ice in asking for an information interview? And that's a great, and, and that's a great question. Why do people say yes to information interviews? Anybody? Someone help them. So help them in the past. They love to get advice. People love to get advice. People like to talk about themselves. So the key is what you want to do is is know that know that they don't mind that you're asking. You can, however you're choosing to connect. I think email is fantastic. When I was doing info interviews over 20 years ago, I had to like <coughs> write letters to introduce myself and then call. Um, so now it's easier, but just a quick note or a phone calls, a little 30 second pitch on who you are and why you're calling. Ideally, you've had somebody who might have referred you or maybe you found them on LinkedIn. And you can say, hi, I, just, I was just reading your profile on LinkedIn or Mary Smith referred me to you <coughs> as an expert, as somebody else who's into the new field of music medicine, yeah. medicine. medical musicianship. I'm into that too. Can we talk and meet for a few minutes? Can I just take 20 or 30 minutes of your time? Um, and if they, if you, or if not, could you refer me to somebody else? If you ask nicely, three, one of three things is going to happen. They're going to ignore you. <laughs> oh well. They're going to say no because they're a really busy person, or maybe they're just mean and don't like helping people. That's really rare. Mm -hmm. Nothing against you either. Those are two. Just have a thick skin. And the third one is they're going to say yes, and you're going to have a fabulous conversation. Just don't be afraid. It is, I remember I would have to dial the phone three times when I was making those phone calls to ask for an info interview. I know the feeling, even though I stand up here and look up, yeah, yeah, do an information interview. It's stressful to pick up those phones and make those networking connections or, or to send an email. And just read your email really carefully, proof it, make sure it looks good, maybe run it by somebody to make sure it sounds okay if you're not confident. Um, but go ahead and do it. Don't let, don't let that but they might say no or but I'm going to bother them stop you. It's probably more than you're going to bother them, right? That's, yeah, that, that was me. I don't want to bother anybody. I don't want to be a bother. So yeah. Um, other questions? It looks kind of a go off and uh, extend it. Is everybody crazy busy? <laughs> like how many times, because somebody may read it and forget about it and they have good I would, Yeah, I would, I would maybe a couple weeks later resend. I would never say you didn't answer my email. I've gotten that myself. Really pisses me off. <laughs> um, just, just, you know, resend it. And if after a couple times you don't hear from them, just move on to the next prospect, or which you're hopefully doing. Is, um, give it another try. Maybe pick up the phone and try calling them. It could just be, you know, they don't know you. They've left the, the email drop down and they've forgotten about it. And the second time will remind. If not, they're just too busy. You can just move on. Yeah. I just want to add to that when you do get the informational interview or coffee talk, I think it's really important to send that thank you card oh, thank to you. them. Yes. Either, I, I like handwritten cards. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's coming back to that because it adds such a personal note. Mm -hmm. And then when those positions come up or opportunities, you're in their head once again because you followed up and exactly. said thank you. You showed appreciation. And you would even, as you're making this change and making these connections, keep a spreadsheet, keep some sort of log. And as you make progress or, make, or looking at your next step, touch base with those people every couple, three months. Hi, I just wanted to let you know this is what's going on. It keeps you, the thank you note is excellent. Thank you, and definitely thank you note. Handwritten for this is good because you're not in the time constraint of, of a job interview where I've kind of moved to email. Oh, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, because yesterday I opened two thank yous, hard copy for somebody that the decision mm -hmm. is accepted. And, and so, the, yeah, no. yeah. I think I have a couple comments to make regarding that, too, because I constantly have to kind of get appointments out of people that don't have time to talk to me. Mm -hmm. So a couple of things that I need to always reference somebody that they know. Make sure that that other person really does know that you're asking. Yeah. Yeah. And then say, and then also suggest a tentative time yeah. or a date. I will be in the yeah. area on this time. Yeah. It'll be okay. So now that they don't have to like, go <coughs> and make an appointment. So kind of keep it moving forward keep moving with forward. that. Right. And also to use a connection. If there's a Hopkins alumni connection or any type yeah. of alumni, any type of connection, alumni point network that time. out so that they, I mean, it's kind of unwritten code. You've got to do it. <laughs> I really, so, oh, thank you for mentioning it. Yeah. 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 We're all here together in an alumni network. Right. Many of you are here through graduate school, so you have a different undergraduate alumni network. Many of you are here through undergraduate, and you have a different graduate network. 
youth growth networks. It is a door opener. If you don't have a person at least to say, you know, I saw the Johns Hopkins group on LinkedIn, I found your profile. At least anything for a connection, so I totally agree with that. 